And the theme of this one, to wrap it all up, is probably the biggest of them all, uh, species identity, in particular our species. Um, what are we? Are we the same as we were when we walked out of Africa sometime around 100,000 years ago, and how are we different if we are? Um, will we change uh, now that we've begun to, begun to understand and manipulate our own genetic essence? Uh, and of course, what are the implications of all that? Uh, politically, ethically, not just medically or scientifically. But mm. Homo sapiens, the first truly free species, is about to decommission natural selection, the first that made us. There is no genetic destiny outside our free will, no lodestar provided by which we can set course. Evolution, including genetic progress in human nature and human capacity, will be from now on increasingly the domain of science and technology, tempered by ethics and political choice. We have reached this point down a long road of travail and self-deception. Soon we must look within ourselves and decide what we wish to become. I might want to say uh, that we need to develop a much more uh, perspicuous conception of what is involved in human free will. Uh, the idea that one chooses ex nihilo, as it were, out of some kind of spiritual call within which just goes as it lifted and follows the spirit um, is perhaps uh, not so well judged as Nietzsche's take on this um, concept. Nietzsche faces squarely the fact that every one of us has a multitude of souls with the forces pulling us in many different directions. So the question becomes not whether you have a free will, which might suddenly leap this way or that under some uh, indiscernible influence, but what is the strength of your will? To what extent can you harness, direct, be confident in and have the skills to use these various forces within to some purpose uh, which you feel is worthy of your attention and your prosecution. I mean, the first issue that Ed raises is, are humans still biologically evolving? And the reality is that barring some dramatic epidemic, which we could well face later this year, the influences on, uh, on our biological evolution, that is our genetic evolution, uh, natural selection, are, are, are weak, very weak. The second issue that Ed raises, though, is that the world has changed and changed dramatically. And of course, the issue is that the world has changed in a way that is no longer compatible with our biology, and we can talk about that. I mean, no doubt we will. The third issue, which is the one that Grant has picked up on, is the extent to which we might manipulate our biology using various tools of, biology, of genetic engineering and so forth. I will come back to that, no doubt, in some detail. But he alludes to, but in, in his, elsewhere in his other writing, is of course about the extent to which we've destroyed the world using our technology, and that's what's caused the whole issue in the first place. I thought, going back to the original picture, that rather overblown and inflated was the thing I would have a go at, or that thing about it. Particularly that thought about, here we are at the crossroads. It's not that I think we're not at a crossroads, it's just we've been at crossroads an awful lot of times before. Um, I mean, I wonder when somebody first said Human beings have never been like this before, referring to a rather small group of very privileged human beings. Um, it's never been like this before. These wonderful choices are before us. Uh, what will we do? What will we become? Um, thousands of years ago, I expect, somebody said that. As I say, that's not to say that we're not at one, but that before we get too excited about it, one ought to remember how often that's happened before and the sort of pitfalls that have come up against it, namely just the very simple straightforward ones. People are going to disagree about what we can do and they're going to disagree about what we should do and it's going to require an enormous amount of collective endeavour where we agree to do anything. <laughs> I think it's 
it's somewhat arrogant for humans to think that they are now on the threshold of manipulating the genetic future of six to nine billion people. And I think we have to keep that in perspective. We can introduce genes into genetic lines if we want to a handful of people, not to six billion. So I do feel uh, we're jumping the gun a bit. I think humankind is facing much bigger crossroads, one of depleting resources, simple overcrowding and disease outbreak. And I don't think that the genetic manipulation influence is the one that's going to be felt in the next 50 years. Peter remarked that our biotechnology has got us to a point of maladaptation. Stephen, of course, pointed out that our biotechnology and the powers we've gained that way has a relatively small impact uh, in terms of direct effects on the human organism. And therefore, I think we do have to think at the end about the incentives we apply to our technology. What incentives are applied? Are they incentives which are more like those of the chimpanzee, an extremely, where there is an extremely highly developed competitive and aggressive streak, or are they incentives more like those of the bonobo, where cooperation, the facilitation of the abilities and, and survival of others becomes a very strong value that you see in a bonobo tree. Uh, and we might think of human beings the same way. It's not that any of our technology in itself is either good or bad, but the way we use it, that could be disastrous or it could be extremely uplifting. The, the, the point I wanted to make was it's fairly clear that humans evolved to live in social groups of about 100 to 150 people. It's called the Dunbar number. Uh, after uh, an anthropologist and cultural anthropologist in, in Britain who, who pointed out that in every form of human organisation we're most comfortable in groups between 100 to 150 people and if you look at the size of a region of our brain called the neocortex in relationship to the popular group size we live in in relationship to all other primates we predict from looking at the primate relationship we should live in a group size of about 120 people. Now clearly, the modern, dense world of, of, of both developing and developed nations is such that very few people live in a context of 100 to 150 people. We live in this very, very complex society. My own bias is that many people are in a situation where they cannot cope with, with an environment and the number of interactions which are beyond our evolved capacity of our brain we really have social adaptation to. I think we've got to be careful about the numbers here too, because we know, for instance, that the number of pieces of data that you can hold in short-term memory is seven, but perhaps can be average, well, but I for you guys. <laughs> but depending on how you pass the data, which of course we've developed huge techniques of chunking and parsing data so that they become, so that we can assimilate greater amounts. And one of our most effective techniques is building the data into a story, which then allows us to absorb a hugely greater amount than what you might expect from seven random words or random numbers. So we do have to think about, if we are suited to groups of 100 to 150, I presume in one functional configuration of the neocortex, and we know that the neocortex is capable of more than one functional configuration using some basic programs, such as language programs, and a number of different, what we might call personae, uh, borrowing the Greek term. Uh, we, we need to think about how we, each of us, manage to divide our world up so that at any given time, the relationships we exist in the midst of do approximate to that number that we're comfortable with. And some people can and some can't. And I think that if you take uh, some of the evolutionary psychiatrists like Randy Nessie, they would argue that that is the origin of a lot of the minor uh, mood disorders of the modern world. Is there a way of looking at things such as, and it's partly what Peter was alluding to, that ethics and morality 
are innate in some sense. I know we have to define what innate means, but but I mean, surely there's an adaptive um, point to our ability to be moral. I mean, is there an instinct for things like freedom, perhaps? I don't know. Well. I would just quote an authority here. Aristotle said, right, <laughs> um, we have the virtues neither by nor contrary to nature. We're fitted by nature to receive them. And one way to look at that is to say, well, um, Aristotle did not need evolutionary theory to tell him that we were social animals, right? We're not born good. Any mother knows that, right? Um, children have to be taught to be my polite and kind. Um, <laughs> um, no, horse whisper, horse whisper. <laughs> um, and they have to be taught to share, all that kind of thing. But here's the claim about our being the social animals. When we acquire the virtues, we don't find them a constant battle. It's not as though they are imposed on a nature which is fundamentally selfish. This is one of the things that Duval was talking about, was that kind of ludicrous story, really. I don't know why it ever got off the ground, where people said, oh, well, the thing about us is because we're rational, we're really just 100% self-interested, and we only kind of go into society as a kind of club, and you know, I scratch, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. The elephants didn't need a social contract. The wolves didn't need a social contract. The apes don't need a social contract. We didn't need a social contract. We're social animals. So all those virtues that enable us to live really well together, they're not imposed on a nature that's contrary to that. That's what he means by I'm being fitted to receive them. So there's the thought that there's a, a sense to their being innate in one way and not in another. In, you might say, in a very closely parallel way, this is what Grant was saying earlier, um, not when we were talking about that. The languages, that is, we're not born able to speak, but we're born with the capacity to acquire language, and I mean nothing could be more natural for human beings than having language. Are species still evolving? Are All species, species are still evolving. There's still pressure on species. The question for us is can we evolve quickly enough which we can't. Can well, I don't think, I don't know. Well, Actually. we're talking only here about biological evolution. There's, yeah. of course, another form of evolution, yeah. which is cultural evolution. And if we can reflect it, and, well, but that, that policy is part of culture used in this context, right? Uh, that, in fact, has its technology. And so that the issue is that humans are changing, not primarily because of biological processes, but because of our cultural processes, cultural inheritance, cultural evolution. Culture changes very rapidly. Uh, we know, both in animals and in humans, that stress early in life will lead to different behaviours later in life. And you can actually relate that to changes in the biochemistry of the brain, which are analogous to what happened in this case by, from, from variation in the sequence of a bit of DNA. So the point is there are different ways to get variation in what you are. It can happen because of genetic variation, can happen because of developmental variation, and and those two things lead to lead to why each of us is different. What about your eye? The cells in your eye have exactly the same genetic makeup as the cells in your big toe. But should your eye ever get poked out, don't cut off your toe and put it there because <laughs> it won't do you the slightest bit of good. Um, and so obviously something has happened in the development of the eye to the genes which it has in common with the big toe that has made it into an eye. And what you see there, Aristotle again has this wonderful saying, sight is to the eye as the soul is to the body. Um, what you see there is just something in minor which is writ large in human beings, that they are creatures who have become a certain way because of the way they have mobilized their genes to serve adaptive purposes in environments which they are now increasingly creating and interacting with so that we are getting a looping effect. Uh, we are making ourselves into the kind of creatures who can inhabit the world that, that we are making for ourselves.